We're talking about making sense of worship and the church today. And so it's great that we are gathered early in the morning on a Saturday to just make sense of what worship is all about and how we as the church ought to be worshipping our Lord. All right. So today uh, we will be covering two two parts uh, of the session today. Uh, And that is this. Uh, We're looking at the heart and practice of worship today. Uh, For hearts, we are looking at the nature, the theology, the shape and the elements of worship. And then we will break out into our discussion groups uh, small, for a short time. And then we will then come back for perhaps a quick Q&A and then we'll take a break for a short while before coming back for the second part, which is the practice of worship. How we gather, we listen to the word together, we have a meal, the holy meal together, and then we are being sent off back into the world. All right. Then the following week, uh, next week, next Saturday, we'll be talking about the sacraments in worship. So that's baptism and Last Supper. All right. So let's begin this time with a call to worship. We are talking about worship. And so let's respond to this call to worship. So the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight and together, O Lord, my my rock and and my my redeemer. Recently, I've been asked this question uh, via a text message and someone asked me, you know, uh, Pastor, why do we come to church even when we cannot Uh, when we cannot even sing, right? Uh, And another uh, church member, uh, indirectly through a church leader, also asked, uh, why do we come to church when we cannot even fellowship? You know, so we all look out for different things uh, because we are wired differently, you know, we feel differently. And to us, church can be various things, right? Uh, Some long to be able to sing when they come to church. Some long to have fellowship when they, want, when they come to church. And uh, when these elements are missing, we feel like, ah, today, you know, there's something missing. We are not able to uh, be the church uh, that uh, God wants us to. Uh, and sometimes we can be so fixated in one element of the overall worship that we miss out on the fact that we can still worship God. We can still come and be the church in so many other ways. Right, And so it's important for us, therefore, to know that there's so much more to our worship than just our natural inclinations. And all these different parts of worship help us to grow in all areas of our faith. Right, So that's what we we want to explore more uh, today. What is the, firstly, nature of worship? What is worship in its very essence? Well, uh, most commonly, uh, how we think about worship is this. You know, worship is our self-expression towards God, right? It is us crying out to God, us worshipping God, us expressing our thanks, our praise unto God, right? That's our uh, very basic understanding of what worship is. And in the Old Testament, the word uh, shaka is an expression, it's a word used for worship. And it talks about how people bow down, they prostrate themselves, they have this reverence for this other that they are worshipping, that, that they are shakaying to, right? Uh, and so God is seen as someone that we give reverence uh, to in the Old Testament because he's of worth and he's of uh, uh, skip meaning uh, a bit this, uh, for us to be able to, the other that we know that is worthy for us to praise. Yeah? So that is, that is worship. We give reverence. We bow down towards this other person who is of worth. But not only that, worship is actually a form of God's self-expression towards us. It is when, in the Old Testament, when God revealed himself to the people, right, uh, that they begin to worship him. When God revealed himself uh, in the burning bush to Moses, when God revealed himself cloud by day, fire by night, the people worship him. When God reveals himself to us through his word and through his sacraments, we worship him. This is 
worship as us seeing who God is, even as he reveals himself to us. So that's the other part of worship. It's not only us coming to God and worshiping him as if it's, as if it's so distant, so far away, but this is our worship of God is seen as also God's self-expression towards us. He encounters us even as we draw near to him. He encounters us through his word. He encounters us through his sacraments. He pours out himself towards us. Worship is also God's self-expression towards us. Worship is also service. A service that the people of God does unto him and for the world. In fact, the Latin word for worship or liturgy is the word liturgia, which is which literally means the work of the people. So when we come together as a church, when we worship, in a sense, we are doing the work of the people. We are representing the world in worshipping God. We are working on behalf of the world in worshipping the God of all creation. And that is why we do things like we pray on behalf. We pray on behalf of others. We are doing the work of the people on behalf of others to pray for them. We pray for creation. We pray for the world. We are doing the work of the people. In a sense, when we worship, right, we are bringing the longings, we are bringing the desires, we are bringing the praise of the world to worship this God who created the whole world. We are representing all people even as we worship. So worship is not just our self-expression towards God, not just God's expression towards us. Worship is our work on behalf of whole of the whole humanity in worshipping the God who created all of us, right? So that's worship as well. Worship as remembering. When we come to worship, when we sing of uh, hymns, when we sing of songs, we are rediscovering, we are re-proclaiming the identity that we have in Christ. We are remembering who we are as a people of God. When we sing of how we want to be a people who are holy and righteous. We're singing of kind of values that we want to exhibit as a people. We're remembering the values that we, of who we are uh, as a people of God. And we remember the source, the source of all whom all blessings flow, right? We remember the source who is God himself. Worship is seen as a remembering of who we are and of who God is. But not only that, worship is also a remembering. We are different members of the body of Christ. We are different parts of the body of Christ. And when we come together to worship, we are remembering ourselves. It's like the different parts of the body of Christ coming together. Uh, I grew up watching this cartoon called, um, um, it's not Ultron, oh, the Marvel uh, bad, bad person, uh, Ultron, has now clouded my, the name. Was it Vo Voltron? Voltron is the cartoon that I grew up uh, watching. And Voltron has got this uh, five different vehicles. Uh, and these five different vehicles, you know, when they are facing the big bad guy at the end of the episode, all these five different vehicles will come together. One will be the arm, one will be the body, one will be the leg, one will be the head, you know. And uh, they will come together and they will find the big bad. Uh, monster, right, at the end of uh, each episode. And so worship is like this, you know, we are different parts of the body, we are coming together, we are worshipping God. God is, Christ himself is a head of the church. He comes and invites in his body, the body of Christ, even as we, in a sense, fight against the monsters uh, of this world, where we pray against uh, um, evil, and we pray for liberation. You know, we're coming together, remembering ourselves as the body of Christ with Christ as our head to be able to now then declare God's liberty and God's love and God's blessing upon the whole world. And so worship as remembering. And so if you can see, the nature of worship, worship is such that it's not just music. It's not just we coming, expressing our love towards God and our thanksgiving towards God. There's so much more to worship. Even if only one person is gathered, right, and we and that one person comes before God's word, uh, worship happens because God is revealing Himself to this person. When this person comes and prays for the world, worship happens because we are rendering a service for the world 
unto the Lord. When we come together as a body of Christ, we are worshipping. So there's so much more to worship than just singing. And that's the nature of worship that's been revealed to us in the Word of God. But deeper than that, the theology of worship is such that, you know, worship happens when the presence of God comes mightily upon the people of God. In the Old Testament, we read about how God wants to dwell amongst his people, right? And he therefore uh, told uh, the people of God to erect a tabernacle uh, for him so that this becomes a physical place that will invite his almighty presence. It becomes a physical place that helps to be able to house that invisible and almighty presence uh, of God. And so the tabernacle, tabernacle was built in the Old Testament. And thereafter, when the people of God began to assemble in Jerusalem as the city of God, uh, God began to reveal the temple plans to them. And Solomon was the one who built the first temple. Subsequently, uh, the second temple built by, or rebuilt by uh, Herod. Uh, and that became the dwelling place of the presence of God. And so God desires to come in a very manifested manner, in a manner that the people of God can encounter him in a very tangible way by being present in the worship of his people, by being present amongst his people. And now in the New Testament, we know that Christ came in bodily form, right? And as he came, dwelt in the body of a human being, the people came to worship. They're now able to, they were now able to worship Christ, God himself, his very physical manifested presence amongst them and worship him in such manner. And so there's a sense that when we come to worship, you know, God desires for his presence to be amongst us. And we read in the New Testament when two or three are gathered in his name, he is present. It's only when we gather together and we gather in his name that God's presence comes amongst us in a mighty way. And there is a need therefore for us to gather because when we gather, the presence of God is here with us. But your worship is not just about the presence of God. It is primarily about the presence of God. When the presence of God comes, we're able to worship and we are compelled to worship. But it's also fundamentally theological, meaning it is about who God is and what he is like. Theo meaning God, logical meaning, you know, how the word that's spoken about God. And worship is therefore fundamentally theological. We express our affirmations of who God is in our worship. We sing of how he is holy, how he is good, how he is amazing, amazing love, right? How he is loving and how he is faithful. And these are our theological affirmations of who God is when we worship. When we pray, we pray words like, Lord, in your faithfulness, won't you manifest yourself, your healing upon this brother or this sister. We are declaring our understanding of who God is, the attributes of who he is, even as we pray. We declare he's faithful, and because he's faithful, we can come to him to ask for healing upon our brother or sister, right? We are declaring about who or what he is like. Lord, you're a God who never leaves us nor forsake us. We're declaring what he has declared himself to us, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And we are saying to God, God, therefore, you know, we can trust in you. We are expressing something theological, fundamentally theological, even as we come to worship, whether in singing, whether in prayer, whether in our meditations, whether in reading God's word, it is fundamentally theological. And so some would say these words, lex orandi, lex credendi, you know, is a, is a affirmation uh, by, the, uh, by the worship theologians that this uh, lex orandi, lex credendi, which means a rule of prayer or worship, you know, prayer in a sense of it being a worship unto a lot, is our rule of believing, our doctrine. When we come to worship God, when we come to pray before God, you know, the declarations that we declare of who God is, that affirms in our spirit, again, who God is, what he is like, and it helps us in our believing, in our doctrine of who God is. 
it is when we sing hymns and these hymns expresses uh, uh, who God is and what he's like, then it leads us to be able to believe in who God is and who he's like. So singing is a form of being able to teach us even in our doctrines, even in our believing as well. But not just that, not just worshipping, not just praying in, all, in teaching us how to believe in our doctrines, but it is when we believe in our doctrines, then we sing it out. We pray it out as well. So it reaffirms each other, right? The rule of prayer affirms the rule of believing and the rule of believing affirms the rule of prayer. And that's how worship helps us to grow in our theological knowledge of our God as well. And not only that, worship is not just simply men's activity, as we said earlier, you know, sometimes you can see as, oh, we're coming together to worship God. But more accurately, it is actually God's activity in men and for men. When we come to worship, more accurately so, this is a worship that's been enabled by God himself. God is now enabling us by his Holy Spirit to come together as people of God to worship him. This is God leading us, compelling us, drawing us to worship him. This is God's activity in our lives. And not just in our lives to enable us to worship him, but for us, you know how sometimes, sometimes right, when uh, I uh, have told you all before that, you know, I belong to this group of uh, uh, a, a, an accountability group, uh, with uh, seven, with six other guys, so there are seven of us. And sometimes, you know, we and we meet once a month. Sometimes we we you know uh, drag ourselves to go for these accountability meetings because oh, it's another two hours. You know, we're so busy already, right? And we drag ourselves to the meeting. But when we are there and we share with one another our highs, our lows, our prayer requests. Uh, and we affirm into one another's life, you know, that we can still press on and to uh, believe in a God who is still with us, who builds his church and all that. And then we find ourselves recharged and renewed. This is God coming to affirm us, to build us up, even as we worship him in such a manner. And likewise, many of us feel that, right, when we come to worship on Sundays, uh, we may be feeling down, we may, we may be feeling... Uh, anxious in one way or another but when we come and we worship the Lord the Lord does something in us and for us to build us up in our faith once again to build us up in our knowledge of him once again to build us up to know that he's present in our lives once again and he has not forsaken us he had not forsaken us he's still with us and something changes in us our countenance changes and we become more hopeful uh, and we are able to trust in him once again and so that's God doing something in us so worship is not just about we doing something for God and to God, but more accurately, it is God's activity in all of our lives. It is God drawing us to worship him so that he can do something in our lives for us. So we believe that theology, therefore, uh, the theology of worship in men, therefore, is not just about men's activity, but God's activity primarily. And so the Bishop uh, Augustine, of Hippo in the of the early church, one of the early church fathers uh, would therefore write this in his reflection. He said, You move us to delight in praising you. God, it is you who move us to delight in praising you, for you have formed us for yourself, and our hearts are restless till they find rest in you. God desires for us to be able to rest in Him, even as He draws us to worship Him. So this is God's activity. In men. And so when God draws us, therefore, worship is our rightful response towards God. When we see God doing things in our lives, when we see God drawing us, when we see God's overtures in our lives, our rightful response is worship, to thank Him, to thank Him for who He is and for thank, to thank Him for what He's doing in our lives. And therefore, this, in, in Revelations uh, chapter 15, and when all the people of the world came together, you know, this is the affirmation that has been made. Great and marvelous are your deeds. This is what you've been doing, O oh God, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways. You're the king of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. 
again, the affirmation of who God is. All nations will come and worship before you. When we see God's mighty works, when we know who he is, we will come and we'll worship before you. It's our rightful response to God for your righteous acts have been indeed revealed. So worship is a rightful response to what God is doing in all of our lives. But not only that, worship is also witness. When we worship God as a people of God, when we gather in his name, we are witnessing to the world. This God that we proclaim, this God that we lift up, this God that we worship, we are saying to the world that this God deserves our worship because of who he is. When we proclaim his attributes with our songs, when we pray, we are declaring to the world that this is who we believe in and he is worthy to be praised indeed. And now the world is able or the church is able to worship, to witness even more, right? With our online uh, worship uh, services. So there is a place, I think, in the future for this online worship. Uh, we are able to witness more. We are able to send uh, our worship services, our sermons, our worship songs uh, to our friends and our loved ones. And so perhaps that's one good thing that is coming out of this online services. We are able to witness using our worship. Uh, when we worship God, you know, it becomes something that uh, the, the world can see and is being drawn to. Um, I may have shared this before, but, uh, you know, it was uh, my wife, uh, when uh, a friend of hers brought her to, uh, you know, in the, 19, in the 1990s, right? There's this uh, festival of praise uh, that, held, that is held in the indoor stadium almost every year. And so a friend of, uh, of hers brought her to the festival of praise. And during the festival of praise, my wife saw people around her worshipping. She wasn't a Christian then at the point in time. She saw people around her worshipping. She saw people around her encountering God so visibly with tears in their eyes, as if God was touching their lives, touching their hearts. And they, they, they were crying. And it was through that that led her to pray, you know, God, if you are real, you know, wouldn't you also uh, make me cry, right? And then she began crying and she encountered God that way. So it was the worship of other, other people around her that was witnessing to the reality of God for her. And that led her to want to seek after God. That led her to want to see the reality of God for her own life. And that uh, led her to ultimately be able to worship God herself as well. And so worship is a witness unto the world as well. And we need to come and continue to worship. Okay? So you see, there's so much more to the nature and theology of worship than just coming and singing to God. And even if you cannot sing, we need to come to worship. We come to worship by remembering ourselves as a body of Christ. We declare to the world that God is still worthy to be praised, even if we cannot sing. We are declaring to the world that there's a place for worship that goes beyond just singing. And so we need to come and to declare that we are gathered in the presence of God. God is here amongst us and we're encountering him still because this is God's work in all of our lives. And it's not just we, when we are unable to sing, it doesn't mean that we cannot worship. Worship is so much more. Worship is about the presence of God himself and God's activity in all of our lives. And that's why we come together to worship. And when we do so, we are responding to God's overtures in our lives and we are witnessing to the world. So there's a place for us to still come, even if we cannot sing, even if we cannot fellowship, and so much more to worship. And that's why worship over the... Uh, history of the church uh, has developed a kind of order because we want to be able to remember all these various aspects of the theology of worship, of the nature of worship. And so we order ourselves in such a way that helps us to remember to do all these various areas of what it means for us to worship. And so there is a shape of worship. There is an order of worship. Ordo goes beyond order. Ordo is like the deep structure of worship. And that's what worship theologians would call the deep structure of worship, the deeper um, uh, process or procession of worship that all worship uh, services or all worship gatherings should go through. And it is a fourfold uh, shape of worship, starting with the gathering, when people come together 
we remember ourselves as the body of Christ, we are gathering in God's name, and we are assembling, therefore, to worship God. So that's the first movement, the gathering. And then we listen to the word of God. We listen to God's revelation towards us so that we may respond to his activity in our lives thereafter. So the word is uh, a part of the second movement of the shape of worship that allows us to be able to see God's activity in our lives in a very real way. And then, of course, the meal, the holy meal, the holy communion, where we remember, now we remember the commandments of Christ to do this in remembrance of him. We are following in his ways and we are receiving his grace in a very tangible way so that in the fourth movement, we may be sent back into the world to be his vessels of grace, of love, of truth, to be able to, uh, in a sense, change the world you know, for him. We are empowered by Holy Meal in the third movement to then go forth being sent back into the world. So the four movements, gathering, word, meal, and sending. And so this movement, uh, this four, uh, fourfold shape of worship uh, has already been part of the early, early church. Uh, Justin Martyr, uh, Justin is his name. A martyr was then given to him when he was martyred for Christ. And so he's called Justin Martyr. Uh, and so he is a Roman Christian. And uh, it is likely in and around 150 CE that he wrote um, this um, short uh, series of writings called The First Apology. And it is uh, a description of what the early church did, even in their worship. And Justin Martyr wrote of how they will read the records of the apostles, uh, the letters that they wrote, uh, the gospels that they wrote. And so they will read the records of these all the apostles and they will read the writings of the prophets uh, of old, uh, so the Old Testament. So they'll read the Old Testament, they'll read the um, what we now call as the New Testament, the letters of the apostles, the gospels of the apostles. And then they will listen to a sermon uh, to get a sense uh, of what God is saying to them at this point in time. And last, and yesterday, right, our lectionary reading is from Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. At the end of verse 8, it, it says, you know, even as Ezra read the, the word of the law of the Lord, uh, the word of God to the people, there were people there who were uh, giving the sense of what had been read to the people who did not understand, right? So it was like a sermon that the group leaders would then preach uh, to the members uh, to help them to understand more about uh, what was being read uh, on the uh, for the word of the word of God. And so, likewise, that's uh, what the sermon is all about. You know, the uh, Justin Martyr wrote that they came together, they read the scriptures. And then thereafter, somebody gave the sense of what they were reading, helps them to understand what they were reading. And then thereafter, they partook in the bread and the wine, the holy meal, before they left. And so this fourfold shape uh, of worship had already been instituted, had already been practiced by the early church from minimally 150 uh, CE. All right? But some, some may ask, you know, why do we uh, listen to the word first uh, before we uh, partake of the holy meal? Can we just eat first and then we, you know, as we eat and then we will have uh, the word uh, together? Uh, and uh, typically throughout church history, uh, the, church, the church had always uh, listened to God's word first before we partake of the meal together. Why? Because we believe that the preaching of God's word creates faith in us. It is God depositing a faith in us through his word, even as his word is being declared. And it is that faith that then enables us to be able to receive the holy meal uh, in a manner that uh, is, uh, in a sense, worthy you know, of uh, God's grace into our lives. We must receive God's grace with faith. And so the word, therefore, sets the appropriate context for the meal. Can you imagine if without the preaching of God's word and we just come together and just and we just say, okay, uh, okay, we have sung our worship song now and let us now have uh, the Holy Communion together. Then some of our 
newer Christians, newer believers may not understand, oh, what is this meal all about? We're just going to eat together? And in fact, uh, in the early church, that's what the church has been, had been accused of. You know, when they didn't, when outsiders didn't understand the context of the meal, they accused the church of being cannibals because they were saying, you know, oh, this, this, this group of people, they eat uh, uh, human flesh and they drink of human blood, you know, because they didn't understand, right, the context of the holy meal. And likewise, therefore, the word sets the appropriate context for the meal. When we talk about faith, what is this? When we talk about what God has been doing, when we talk about what, how Christ sacrificed himself for all of us, then we understand what a holy meal truly means. And that is why um, if you look at the liturgy of the, of the Holy Communion, there's always a part just in case, you know, the word of God that's being preached, right, has got totally nothing to do with the Holy Communion. Then uh, the liturgy of the Holy Communion actually sets out uh, why we have this meal, right? Uh, and, we, and we'll talk about it later. Uh, about how we talk about the narrative of the whole, of uh, the context of the Holy Communion and all that. All right. So the word always sets therefore the context uh, for the meal, and so the word comes before the meal. But other than the shape of worship, we also want to talk about the elements of worship. There's so much about worship than just singing. Firstly, there are the rituals, uh, and people go through rituals because it helps them or helps us to be able to uh, understand uh, and to, uh, in a sense, deposit deeply into our being uh, the things that we do in worship. And so when we talk about uh, worship, we talk about rituals that we all go through over time, whether or not we know that there are rituals, but uh, we do go through it. And so uh, rituals help us to be efficient and help us to regulate uh, what we do rather than going all over the place, right? And sometimes, you know, when we don't plan, uh, when we can end up going all over the place. Uh, and so rituals help us after a while to be efficient in uh, how we worship the Lord uh, and we regulate uh, within proper boundaries of how uh, we should worship God. Otherwise, Variant theologies can come. Uh, people can introduce uh, things that uh, you know they see in the world, and they say, "Hey, it's a good thing to do," you know. But without proper rituals, you know, we can go all over the place. And it's important for us to be, be able to therefore see that we have got pro proper structure, and people can see that hey, these are not um, how I say flippant people uh, who will just do their own things even as they worship, but there is some regulation to it so that they know that these are rightfully put in place within boundaries. And the rituals help us to be able to um, create meaning, um, even as we worship. We give a sense to the people of why we are doing these things. It is the outward form of what we, how we have been formed inwardly in our worship. When we lift our hands, for example, we are declaring to the God that is worthy to be lifted up in praise, right? And so it's an outward form of our inward formation, okay? Uh, it is about how uh, this is what we think of God and now we're expressing it out uh, through the rituals that we are going through, whether is it the doxology, whether is it uh, the uh, Gloria Patri, right? These are all outward forms of our inward formation. But not only an outward form, uh, of our inward formation, it is also the outward form for the inward formation, right? Um, as a young Christian, and I came to the church, uh, I didn't understand the meaning of uh, Gloria Patria, you know, oh, at, at one part of the service, everybody just sings, Glory be to the Father, <laughs> right? And like, okay, we, 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 I'll, just, I'll just sing together, together with them, yeah? Uh, and it is only over time when I sing it again, and again, and again, and I begin to also relate that to what God has been doing in my life, right? And he begins to tell me, and begins to, uh, to in a sense, uh, um, uh, teach me why people sing glory to God. Because they have seen God's activity in their lives. And they want to accrue to God 
you know, all the praise, all the glory that is due to his name, right? Uh, and that's what the Bible uh, tells us too, right? That we need to give glory due to God's name. And that's why we do the Gloria Patri. And But over time, even without knowing, but because I've sang it so many times, informs me, informs me inwardly to be able to come and to give glory to God regularly. It was only because I sang that I could relate my experience to the doctrine and to the theology thereafter, and it formed me in my heart. And so it's not just an outward form of our inward formation, but it's the outward form for inward formation in our lives as well. And so uh, rituals also, uh, the signs and symbols are also part of the rituals that we go through, the bread and the wine signifying for us uh, the body and blood of Christ. Uh, and it's also a symbol, but it's not just a sign, right? It's not just a sign of the body and blood of Christ. The bread and wine is also a symbolic act that we do. It's a symbol of our participation in Christ. You know, do this in remembrance of me. And when we come, we remember Christ. When we come, we are partaking of his grace in our lives. We are imbibing ourselves in his presence. It's a symbol of our participation in what Christ has done and what Christ is doing in all of our lives. Yeah, so rituals help us to imbibe, therefore, in the work of Christ. Uh, and rituals also help us to remember, right? Anamnesis is the word for remembering. Uh, and remembering in a deep way is a remembering not just cognitively, it's a remembering by reenacting, by participating in. And that's what we do uh, when we uh, partake in the Last Supper. And we see in the Old Testament that when uh, they remember the, the festival of the Passover, you know, they reenact once again, right? They reenact uh, wearing their clothes, ready to leave. They reenact the sacrifice. Uh, and they reenact all this because they want to remember. They want to remember who they are. And rituals help us to remember, therefore, and we're remembering again who we are. Again, linking, part, linking back to the theology of worship. We're remembering. And it helps in uh, us having a sense of that continuity with the historic faith that we all belong to. Uh, and there is a sense that even when things become so volatile in the world, even when things become uh, you know, so um, uh, uh, things are changing so much in the world, we are still continuing in our historic confessions of faith, we're still continuing in the historic acts of how we worship God together. There's a sense that uh, because we are able to do all this, right, uh, through the ups and downs of life, things will still be okay. God is still sovereign. God is still in charge. God is still working, right? The continuity gives us the faith to continue to be able to trust in our Lord. And it anchors us, therefore, uh, it helps us to be able to find an anchor in our lives and we are able to uh, not be tossed about by the winds and the waves. We are able to anchor ourselves in Christ whom we are worshipping. And that's how ritual helps us. And therefore, at the end of the day, ritual helps us to be participants of the worship, that we are all involved in this worship of God. It's not about how, you know, we are just watching somebody doing all these things, and uh, we just stand aside to watch uh, and, uh, and, and that's worship. No, worship is about participating in all this, participating in, uh, in, in the ritual so that the ritual itself forms us in our inner being. When we participate uh, in the worship, we are uh, reenacting you know, the symbolic act of how we are remembering ourselves as the body of Christ. When we participate, we are remembering in our heads, in our minds, you know, uh, God's work, when we participate, we are participating in the anchoring and the continuity of the historic faith. But when we don't participate, then many of these do not become real for us because it is another person's worship and it's not our worship and God is not working, therefore, in a sense, in our lives. And so we need to participate even as we worship. But there, other than... Uh, rituals, there are so many other elements of worship. There is a culture, right, uh, of worship in the different contexts. Um, the bread and the wine, in Jesus' time, they were the staple of uh, his time. They were eating bread uh, regularly. Uh, it's 
like rice as to Chinese is bread to uh, the Jews. Uh, wine is like plain water to us. Uh, in their time, they drank wine regularly. And so uh, the bread and the wine were common cultural uh, artifacts, cultural food of Jesus' time. And God and Jesus used this very common food to lay down a sacrament that everybody could practice. Anybody who was in Christ can come, find bread and find wine to be able to participate in him. And so the uh, culturally, um, God is saying that, you know, in all cultures, you should be able to find a bread and a wine or a repl replacements in a sense that helps us to be able to remember the sacraments. But as far as possible, because now bread and wine has become so universal, right? Uh, as far as possible, we try to use bread, wine, or juice as a, as a uh, sign of our unity as the global church, as the universal church in Christ. So we're using bread, bread and wine or bread and wa or wafer, uh, wine or juice, right? But uh, worship is not only deeply cultural, uh, worship is also transcultural, meaning above culture, right? It transcends all cultures. And the commandments of Christ, if it's the truth, it has to trans uh, transcend, transcend all cultures. All cultures come together to obey the commandments of Christ. And no, it's, it's not, not that it's only transculture, it's also countercultural, isn't it? Culture in this world may say something, but if it's wrong, if it's unrighteous, then in our worship, we need to speak against this particular culture. We need to speak truth into this culture. We need to speak light into darkness of this culture. And this truth, this light uh, in our worship are spoken or are prayed or are worshipped. When we declare God's liberation, you know, we are declaring against uh, cultures of the world that seeks to enslave, that seeks to oppress. Uh, and yeah, we speak truth into cultural um, milieus that are not uh, righteous uh, before the word of God. And we speak into, the, into them. Uh, but uh, it is not only countercultural, it worship is also cross-cultural in that we are many different cultures able to come together, expressing our different cultures in a way we worship and still be worshiping that one God, that one Lord. And we see that in Revelations, right? Uh, different tongues, uh, and different people groups all coming together to worship the, uh, the one Lord in that way. You know, we bring our own uh, language of worship. Uh, we bring our own uh, history of worship, our own culture of worship. Some use drums, some use anklong, you know, some uh, use strings, some use a cappella, just voices. And we bring all these different cultures and we are uh, the diverse that diversified body of Christ that is united in Christ, right? So there's diversity in worship, even as we worship cross-culturally as well. And so all, the, all these elements of worship. And so if you, um, let's say, partake in uh, uh, Older's Gate service, right? Well, every year, uh, usually on the uh, Sunday in and around 24th of May uh, in Singapore, organized by the Methodist Church in Singapore, we have our Older's Gate service. And so, you know, in the Methodist Church in Singapore, we've got our English uh, churches, we've got our Chinese churches, and we've got our Tamil uh, churches. And so the, end, the Oldest Gate service has got elements of the English worship, the Chinese worship, and Tamil worship. And there is diversity in that worship, and we are better for it because we express our cross-culturalness in that all peoples can belong to Christ and can worship Christ in the culture that we've been placed in. We are one universal body of Christ, worshiping God in our various ways. And so culturally, uh, we are also a cross-cultural uh, church worshiping God. Of course, then there is the music. Uh, that's an element of worship as well. Uh, but worship is not just about what we sing, but how we sing it, isn't it? And so there's two elements to, that, to singing uh, uh, with music. Firstly, 
uh, what are we singing? The lyrics that we are singing, that's important because remember we said earlier that uh, what we express outwardly also forms us inwardly. So we have to be careful for what, uh, with what we sing. Uh, if we sing questionable theology, then we may be raising up a generation of people who have got questionable theology. So it's important for us to be able to be careful of what we sing. Uh, and a recent uh, critique of uh, the worship songs in the recent years that have come up is this, that the recent uh, genre of worship songs seems to be very me-focused. You know, it's about, uh, it's about me, uh, how I have uh, seen God work in my life. Uh, it's about how I'm responding to God. But it seems less of the theology of worship. It seems less of... Uh, who God is and how he has revealed himself to the world. It sings less of uh, the words of God, the scriptures themselves, but it sings a lot more about our inner feeling, my innermost desires, my innermost hopes, and how God can fulfill my hopes and dreams. And that's a critique uh, of a recent worship. Yeah? So we have to be careful that while there is a place for that, definitely, because in worship where we express our longings, our desires towards God as well, uh, but we have to be careful that it doesn't lean too much towards it, right? And we have to be able to sing of uh, the attributes of God as well. But it's not just about what we sing in the lyrics, it's about how we sing it too. Imagine putting uh, uh, Christian lyrics to questionable songs, you know, uh, that will conjure up uh, wrong images in our minds, right? Uh, and uh, that might not be helpful in our worship, you know, because we won't be, as the Apostle Paul would say, you know, think of what is good, what is righteous, what is honourable, but we'll be thinking about other things, even as we sing those songs, yeah. So it's not just about what we sing, it's about how we sing it as well, okay. Uh, and uh, throughout church history, the assembly, the people of God assembling together has always been the primary musical group. It is a group of people the people of God, the body of Christ, coming together and singing. And therefore, when we worship God through music, it's always been participatory. It's always been a people coming to God, using what God has given them to worship God in music and in song. Yeah. So when we say that, therefore, we're not saying that, oh, those people on stage, huh, they are the worship team you know and we are appreciating their worship no all of us in the sanctuary we are worshipers all together we're all we ought to be all worshiping god through the music uh, together we're not just observing what they are worship what how they are worshiping and uh, and and that's it and so sometimes you know we catch ourselves right wow today's worship very good huh? i feel so ministered right <laughs> or oh today's worship hmm uh maybe sing a bit out of tune eh? you know I, I don't i don't feel you know that i've been ministered by the worship today yeah but if we have the right idea that actually the whole assembly we are the worship team you know it's not about whether we are receiving the worship and we feel good about worship but god himself is the audience our worship goes to him he's the one that we're worshiping he is the audience it's not about whether we feel good from the worship or not. It's about whether God felt good from the worship or not. And if we find ourselves critiquing the worship, then we're not uniting ourselves as people of God, right? In worshiping God. Then we might be the one, you know, who is uh, leading God to be less uh, happy about our worship because we are the ones who are, in a sense, separating ourselves already from the worship. And so we need to uh, have the right idea of what worship is all about. We are the ones who ought to be worshiping God. We are the ones who are, uh, who are channeling our worship to God. We are not the recipients of worship. It's not about how we feel. It's about how God feels at the end of the day. All right? And therefore, if we are the primary musical group, then we have to come and we have to participate in, our, in the worship. And so for those of us who are worshipping online, uh, maybe unable to come to church that weekend, then 
we have to participate in the worship. We have to sing. We have to stand. We have to uh, imbibe ourselves fully in the worship. Uh, we have to be part of the worship. We don't just watch the worship, but we have to participate in the worship. And for those of us who are in person, we still are unable to sing out loud at this point in time, but we can immerse ourselves. We can participate in the worship too. We can lift up our hands. We can sing with our hearts. You know, we can declare to God words spoken that, yes, Lord, in, indeed, your love is amazing. You know, we can declare unto God uh, the songs or the worship or the lyrics or the affirmations of God that the worship team is declaring even as they sing. There should be no audiences per se because God is the only audience. We are all supposed to participate in the worship even as the music happens and we cannot sing, we can still participate. We immerse our, our whole being in the worship, right? And so therefore, worship leaders and vocalists need to encourage participation in the worship, to encourage everybody to, even if you cannot sing, you know, uh, to lift our hands, to clap, to immerse ourselves fully in the worship. And so why do we sing at the end of the day? We sing because it affirms our bodily uh, existence that we are made of flesh god has given us vocal cords and god has revealed himself uh, to the to uh, to the people of all and they can declare their worship of him even through their voices and therefore it affirms that we are we we are people who are made bodily uh, and we therefore sing in such a way to god yeah that uh, it is not just about our minds it's about our whole being and because we have been given this body we worship god with our whole being with our whole body. But it also affirms our bodily existence, that we are a people of God and we join together ourselves in a very real way by singing the same songs, the same lyrics at the same time. It is like uh, us saying that, hey, we are one voice in God and, that, and singing helps us to be able to do so. It affirms our bodily existence as one body of Christ, singing that one song to that one God. Okay? Uh, it also serves the unity of the assembly. You know, when it's like national anthem, right? When people, when we sing national anthem, ah, okay, we are Singaporeans, right? When we say the pledge, we are Singaporeans. Likewise, uh, when we sing, uh, we are again affirming that we are one people in God. We all sing of the same attributes of God at the same time. Yeah, we, so it serves us in helping us to know that we are that one body coming together. It promotes faith formation, uh, said earlier already, how we sing and when the theology of what we sing comes in our minds regularly, we are able to remember uh, the lyrics uh, and it forms us in our theology. Um, when I was young, uh, my mother always said, you know, ah, yeah, you can remember all the lyrics of the songs. Uh, these are not worship songs at the point in time. These are like contemporary songs, you know. Oh, you can remember all these songs, ah. Uh, Wow, so good, ah! Uh. You can remember your uh, schoolwork or not, you know? <laughs> yeah, but somehow, right? We can remember the the lyrics of the song so much e more easily, right? Than our schoolwork. Why? Because it's been put into songs, and the lyric and the and the musicality of the of the song helps us to remember to, to help us to remember the lyrics. And likewise, uh, when we sing of hymns, when we sing of worship songs, contemporary songs, it helps us in remembering the words that we are singing it helps us in the formation of our faith so they remember scriptures we remember the attributes remember the truths of god as well uh, we sing also because it expresses the universality of the church because the church has always been singing right and one day uh, the church will continue to sing even when the when the end times uh, come and when christ comes again Thereafter, we will still be continuing to sing. So in a sense, by singing, we express the universality of the church uh, in time. Uh, the triumphant church is what theologians call the church that has been promoted. Uh, they have triumphed over life and now they are with Christ. They are singing. Uh, the militant church are those that are still, uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, fighting the war between good and evil. Here, we are, we are the militant church here on earth. And so we are also singing. So it joins us in time uh, to, the whole, uh, to the whole church, uh, from the church of all those who have now triumphed in heaven uh, to those who are still on earth right now. It joins us as a people of God. 
because we're all singing. And it joins us in space uh, across all the nations, across all the cultures. We are all singing. Uh, and it's in the singing of God that we join ourselves as a people of God. Yeah, so it's singing is multicultural as well. And it proclaims uh, the gospel when uh, we sing. We sing of God's truth. We sing of God's grace. We sing of God's peace that can come into our hearts. And that's what happened to my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law heard of uh, my uh, CG uh, singing these worship songs uh, in her home. Uh, and that brought her a measure of peace. And later on, she sought to want to know this peace once again. And that's why she asked us whether she, she, uh, we can bring her to church uh, to be able to once again listen to these worship songs. And so it is the worship songs that proclaimed the gospel to her, that proclaimed God's peace to her, and she longed for it. And she desires, therefore, to come to church. And through that, God brought her uh, to know him. And so it proclaims the gospel. Uh, and there is a preparation when we sing and a participation in the eschaton. Uh, eschaton meaning the end times, right? And I said earlier already that when we sing, we, in a sense, this is like a rehearsal for us, you know, to one day to be able to sing up there in heaven with everybody uh, gathered, with all peoples of all times gathered in worshipping God. That's what we'll be doing for eternity, and it's good for us to start practicing now, right? And we're participating, therefore, uh, in the eschaton, because that, was, that will be what we'll be doing to the end of time. And so time, uh, worship is also anchored deeply in time. And this is the, um, the church calendar uh, expressed in a will form. Uh, and so um, right now we are in January. And so this is the epiphany season. If you see, you know, about 10 o'clock, that's where the epiphany is. Uh, and the lectionary readings, if you have been following the Encounter Genome lectionary readings, you realize that it's about how, you know, all the passages that we're reading right now is about how God has revealed himself in the past, in Old Testament, uh, through Jesus Christ and all that. So it's a season of epiphany about, of uh, knowing God, yeah, of having him, him revealed to us. And then we enter into a season of Lent from the 12 o'clock onwards, uh, where we think about uh, Jesus going to the cross. And that will happen uh, usually uh, from February to about April, and then the Holy Week happens, and Easter, uh, where we remember the resurrection of Christ, then the season of Pentecost in red, uh, the ascension of Christ, and then there's the ordinary time uh, for half a year, right? Uh, punctuated with a few small festivals uh, for like uh, uh, All Saints uh, Day and all that is in between. Uh, this is the ordinary time where having now encountered uh, Christ, yeah, we are living out our lives uh, uh, in Christ thereafter. That's the ordinary time, which will then end at about November period, where we begin to anticipate Christmas in the season of Advent. That's anticipation. And then we remember Jesus' incarnation uh, when we go into the season of Christmas tide. All right? So that's the church uh, calendar. And so when we come to church, sometimes we see, right, hey, now we uh, got some, some uh, we don't do it as often now in Topayo, but I remember, we, uh, I heard we used to have, you know, um, either flags or we have a pulpit, uh, not tower, but a, a rope of sorts that signifies the color of the seasons. And so it helps people to remember what season uh, we are in. And if you look at our Encounter Journal, our Encounter Journal, I don't know whether you can see it from my screen here. Um, the, the colors that you see here, it's also uh, based on the church calendar uh, colors as well. All right. So there, it's the tie and all that. Yeah. And this is Pentecost. Season of Pentecost is in red. Okay. So uh, it's to help us to remember which season of the church uh, we are in. It tells the uh, story of uh, of the scriptures and that's why every single year um, people who follow the lectionary reading will remember the the story of the church uh, via the various seasons of the church of the church calendar okay finally there's the element of space uh, uh, in worship you can see here that uh, uh, this is a uh, the St. Andrew's Cathedral 
and St. Andrew's Cathedral, uh, in the Anglican Church, the emphasis is on the sacraments, and that's why you see right in the center, the table, because the Holy Communion is the centerpiece of uh, uh, the liturgy, and uh, the emphasis of the liturgy, and that's why it's right in the center. The word, if you can see, is at the uh, right-hand side. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it's at the right-hand side here. Uh, so the, the sacrament is primary uh, to the word in the Anglican liturgy, and so the word is by the side, but it's elevated, so it's God's word revealing himself to us. And so there's a sense, right, that when we gather in a place like this, you know, these subtle things about uh, space, you know, affirms uh, the theology. It's about how God's word come down to us. God is revealing himself to us. It's about how the, sen the, the, the Holy Communion is so central that we have to gather uh, together as people of God. We have to receive his grace for, his, for us through uh, the remembrance of what Jesus Christ has done for us every single month because it's so important, right? All these uh, plays a part in a forming, informing and reforming our faith as well. Um, but not, not just that. So, for example, you see here that uh, this is a typical contemporary worship uh, 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 sanctuary, but you now see the pulpit being placed right in the middle, right? Right in the middle there. That's where the pulpit is being placed. And so it reflects uh, the kind of theology the church has where the, now the word of God is primary, right? And it's the most important thing. And so it is right in the center with the cross behind. Now, this one, this is a um, church in the U.S. And you see uh, the theology being reflected in, this, in the use of the, of the worship space as well, where the whole people, they're all gathered around uh, the, the platform. Uh, and again, the, now the word, both the word as well as the uh, table is right in the middle. Yeah. And so the people are gathered around. So in a sense, uh, what they're saying is that, you know, uh, in our understanding of worship, yeah, the word and the, and the Holy Communion, they are central to our worship. And all of us, yeah, all of us, we are part of that uh, participation in the worship. There is no, uh, uh, in a sense, performer and audience that can be conveyed, right, in, in uh, settings like the middle one, you know, it can look like, you know, uh, either like a cinema or a performing arts theatre where there is a platform and then there's an audience, you know. So this particular sanctuary, I quite like it, the one on the right, uh, you know, is saying that, you know, there's no audience in our worship. We're all part of it. This is the, the sacraments and the word is central, but we are all uh, worshippers, we are the whole, all of us are the choir, you know, and we are all uh, singing and we are all uh, worshiping God together. There's no audience in a sense, yeah. So that's how uh, space, you know, reflects the theology of worship as well. Uh, for our church, uh, you know, we have a platform. Um, our table is right in the middle, right? For the Methodist Church, uh, in the Methodist system, we do affirm the. Prime, uh, the primacy of uh, the table because this is Christ, how Christ uh, has revealed himself to us. This is what Christ has done. His ultimate work is done uh, on the cross, dying uh, on the cross for all of us. And he, this is his straightforward commandment, do this in remembrance of me. And so when we do this, we affirm ourselves as a people of God. Uh, and so the table is primary, uh, but the word of God is also, in a sense, above us, right? It, uh, uh, it uh, informs us, it's God revealing himself uh, to us as well, okay? But uh, worship is participatory. It's not, we are not the audience. We are the choir together. And so it's important for us to immerse ourselves in worship. Okay, I've spoken a lot uh, and I know that's a lot to take in. I said that the first part is heavier. And so that's why the notes have been given to you so that you can look through it and revise it uh, as well. Uh, but I want to give us some time now to just uh, uh, talk about the theology of worship. Second part, we are talking about uh, the shape or the practice of worship, looking at the, in particular, the fourfold structure of worship. And again, let's begin with a call to worship. 
Alleluia, or praise God in His holiness. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Let everything Let that has breath, has breath praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Praise Him with the blast of the trumpet. Praise Him upon the harp and lyre. Praise Him with timbre and dances. Praise him upon the strings and pipe. Let, Let everything, everything that has breath praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Praise him with ringing cymbals. Praise him upon the clashing cymbals. Let, Let everything, everything that has breath, breath praise the Lord. The Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia, indeed. Indeed, Lord, our desire is to follow you all the days of our lives. So help us, Lord, even in our worship, to be able to do so. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are talking about the gathering, word, and meal, and ascending in this second session. And let's stop straight. Let's go straight into the gathering. The gathering, the idea is, the key idea is that the gathering forms us into a worshipping assembly. You know, we are all scattered, right, all over Singapore, uh, doing our own things throughout the week, uh, living our own lives. But when we gather, the very first part of the service, this is what we do. We want to gather ourselves as a worshipping community, it marks our transition from the world into a worship assembly. It marks our transition from what we've been doing in our own lives uh, as different members of the body of Christ separated, now as a member, as the body of Christ remembered as God's worship assembly. All right? And when we do so, right, we, it speaks of God's character and being of how he desires for us to be united as his body of Christ. It speaks about how God is faithful and he has watched us throughout the week and now he calls us back to be able to be that body once again. It, it, it speaks of God's faithfulness and God's activity in our lives of now drawing us back into his presence to sustain us once again by his grace even as he pours his, his presence into our, into our gathering. And so it speaks of God's character and of God's being and of our need for him. You know, it's like God saying, right, that, that you, you need food every single day. And so you need to eat. You need my presence in your life every single day. And that's why I ask you, I gather you, I bring you into my presence together with the people of God because you need this. You are in need of this. And people who don't have the advantage of being, being able to do so, after a while, you know that they uh, become a bit more easy to give in to hopelessness it's a bit easier for them to be anxious um, because they have not been able to gather as a body of Christ, sustained by God's grace and by the encouragement and mutual, uh, 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 mutual encouragement of the people of God, right? So it speaks of God's character and being and our need for him. And as we gather, it prepares us to hear the word of God. Our posture, our hearts are prepared to now come into his presence and say, yes, my heart is ready, O oh Lord, to listen to you. There's a process of transition, isn't it? From a posture of oh, being very busy, you know, all over, trying to get ready to go to church, getting the children together, you know, clothing them, uh, uh, getting them ready and all that, and then rushing to church. But as we enter the sanctuary before the service starts, we're able to quieten our hearts, we're able to listen to the prelude, and it helps us to prepare our hearts to listen to God's revelation for our lives for that day, right? And that's why sometimes uh, uh, when we don't have that time to transit, uh, we find ourselves flustered and not ready to listen to God's word. It's like how you know research has shown, right, that actually working from home uh, uh, may not be so helpful when people are not able to discipline themselves in the transitions. When we work in the office, uh, there is a transition time, right, when we travel, right? The traveling helps us to get into a mode from being a, father, from being a husband, to now being a co-worker, uh, being a, a manager or, 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 or something, you know, it helps us to switch our minds. And likewise, coming home, it helps us to be able, to, that, that, that journey back home helps us transit from oh, being so high strong at work, no need to get everything done, to now transit back into our role as husband or as father or as son uh, in our families or his daughter in our families, right? So there's a transition period. So this coming in person has the ability to help us to be able to prepare our hearts to listen to the word of God, which sometimes the online uh, worship 
doesn't allow us to be able to do so because we will be, oh, uh, 830, 830, okay, let's switch, switch on YouTube and that's it, we'll, we'll play. We're still in clothes in our pajamas. <laughs> so we're still uh, ha having eaten back breakfast, half, 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 you know, uh, half our breakfast, and then we're still eating breakfast at 29. There's a, there's a lack of transition time to prepare us to hear the word of God. And that's what the gathering tries to help us to do, to give us a transition time to listen to the word of God, all right? And then uh, this bodily posture of, in worship can aid in our inner devotion. When we sit down, when we quiet our hearts, when we begin to close our eyes, this bodily posture is uh, what, what, what um, psychologists would call you know, operant conditioning, right? We're condition, conditioning ourselves to be in a mode of worship, to be in a mode of listening. Uh, and that helps our inner devotion as well. Okay, it's like how we switch off the lights at night before we go to sleep so that it signals to our bodies that it's time to sleep. Right? Likewise, uh, the conditioning of gathering as we do it week in, week out, it helps us to get ready to aid our in inner devotion to be ready to receive and to worship God. All right? So the elements of worship includes all these actually. It's not just, hey, hello, welcome, come, let's, let's worship God. No, there's a lot more uh, in what we do in gathering. Uh, the prelude helps to quieten our hearts. And then, of course, there's the welcome. Uh, the pastor, right, usually goes up and say, hey, welcome, everybody. Uh, it reminds us of who we are as people of God. Then there's a call to worship. Uh, um, yeah, the call to worship, right, uh, for the uh, 8 30 a.m. service. Uh, it's a bit more obvious. It's a liturgical thing, you know. We uh, The worship le the leader says something and then the people respond. Uh, in the in the 10 30 uh, a.m. service, uh, this is what the worship leader does. Everybody, let's stand together, you know, and worship God. That's a call to worship, right? And we do that. And then there's the opening hymn or opening song. Uh, invocation, we don't do it as much uh, in, uh, in our church, but invocation is a prayer where we invite the Holy Spirit's presence to come mightily <laughs> in our midst to enable us to worship. And then sometimes the pastor does doing the welcome, right? The pastor, sometimes uh, amongst us, the pastors, you know, as we welcome you all to, to worship the Lord, we ask you all to stand and then... Uh, one of, one of us uh, sometimes will say, okay, let's pray together as we worship the Lord, as we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. So that's the invocation as well, to come together as people and invite God's presence to come amongst us. And then there's the opening prayer. Uh, sometimes the worship leader leads us through it. Uh, sometimes it's intercessory prayer. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a liturgical prayer. We respond. Sometimes the pastor opens with a word of prayer. And then during Holy Communion Sundays, we have got the confession. Uh, that's part of the as part of the worship, the gathering portion uh, as well. And then there is the, okay, Kiri, Elizon, uh, Lord have mercy. Uh, sometimes we do it in our intercessory prayer, right? We, we add these words, Lord have mercy. And that's a Kiri, Elizon, right? And then Gloria Patria, we do that usually on Holy Communion Sundays. Um, uh, and then the collect prayer, that's something that we prayed earlier. We don't usually do, uh, once in a while we do it when we do the, uh, responsive prayer at the end we have a small collect prayer where we all say together the words before we finish with in Jesus name Amen alright so these are all parts of the gathering uh, elements it helps us to focus our minds on God ready to receive his revelation upon us and then we enter into the word and the word the key idea is the word offers us good news. It is God's grace poured out upon us. It enables us to be who we are even as we go forth back into the world later on. It offers us the good news of who God is and who we are in Christ. It exposes the human need and sin that we have in our lives. Yeah, and offers good news of God's forgiveness. And so it convicts us that you know, we have strayed away from God and God offers us forgiveness still. God does not leave us where we are, but God desires to forgive us and to make us his once again. It serves us in who we are as identity. It reveals to us once again that we are people of God. It creates faith in us as we speak God's word uh, into our own lives and it prepares us for the, uh, for the Lord's Supper, right? For the Holy Communion. Uh, and this is uh, a typical uh, uh, um, desire of every sermon. We say, you know, in our homiletics class, um, in our preaching class, that uh, the purpose of a sermon is to comfort the troubled and to trouble the comfortable. <laughs> if you're too comfortable, we want to trouble you so that, you know, you get out of your comfort zone to, to be uh, holier 
to be more righteous, to, to do the will of God, uh, and, and, and to let God work into your life, right? Uh, so that's the purpose of the word, to comfort the trouble and to trouble the comfortable, okay? And uh, some churches follow the church calendar lectionary, right? So um, in our council journal, we've got a lectionary. And so some churches, in their preaching calendar, every single week, they follow through. Uh, they preach the lectionary, re lectionary reading for the week or for the day. Yeah, uh, in our church, we don't do so. Uh, we believe that it is good for us to be able to address contemporary topics of the day uh, and also at the same time uh, uh, preach through uh, a book of the Bible so that we understand the word of God in its, in its context in the, in the book of the Bible. But during the important seasons or the important dates of the church calendar, like Holy Week, Christmas, uh, Pentecost, you know, then we will actually preach the relevant texts uh, uh, for that season, right? So that we get a sense of the liturgical movement of the church, church calendar as well, but we get deeper into the word as well, all right? So that's what we do in, in Topayo. And uh, the fullest shape uh, of uh, the word, when people read the scriptures, right, in some... Uh, churches, in the high churches, like the Anglican church, they would actually read three Bible readings, one from the Old Testament, one from the Gospel, and one from the New Testament uh, as part of their Bible reading. And then they will preach from one of the passages. All right. So that's the element, that's uh, what uh, the word segment of the fourfold shape of worship uh, does. And the elements of, of the word can include all these, actually. It's not just the preaching itself only, but it's the preparation as well as the sermon, and then thereafter the response, right? So in the word movement, of the fourfold movement of the worship, uh, to prepare our hearts for the word, there's usually a prayer of illumination. And for us, the pastor usually does that, right? Let's read God's word together, and then let's, let us pray. That's a, that's a prayer of illumination to ask the Holy Spirit to come and reveal himself to us, even through the word. Uh, there is the first reading, second reading, uh, which is uh, the fullest reading, right? They would say, right, it's the three readings. First reading, second reading, and then the gospel reading. Uh, usually in Topayo, we read one passage and then we preach on it, right? So it's the first reading. And then uh, once in a while, in the past, I know we used to have the hymn of preparation, but because now we're trying to keep the services as short as possible from because of the government guidelines, we have done away with the hymn of preparation. We only pray for God to prepare our hearts, but when we are able to, we will go back to singing the hymn of preparation, basically it prepares our heart to uh, receive God's word, okay? And then we listen to the sermon that's being preached, God's revelation to us through his word. And then there is a response to God's word. Yeah, a response to God's word can come in the form of the creed, the Nicene creed, you know, we sometimes say during Holy Communion Sundays, right? Uh, it is our response of faith uh, to him, you know, God has revealed himself to us in, in his word and we affirm that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that uh, uh, he will come again to judge the living and, and, and things like that, all right? So it's part of the creed that we, is, is how we respond. And then we respond with prayers of intercession. God has moved us by his word and we want to respond by praying, not just for ourselves, to be able to do so what his word has told us, but to pray for others as well. So sometimes the prayer of intercession can be seen as a response to God's word. And then of course, we want to respond to God's word by now following his commandment to remember him and what he has done for us on the cross through the Holy Communion. And so that's the invitation uh, to come and to partake, the confession and pardon. God has convicted us by his word. He has troubled the comfortable. And so now we confess and we find his good news of forgiveness over our lives. We exchange peace with one another. Having confessed and, and being pardoned by God, we now are able to speak God's peace into one another's life. And we offer ourselves with our tithes and our offerings uh, to him, that's part of the response to God's word uh, in our, in our, uh, in our desire to partner him in what he's doing. So, I'm, so I know in the past, um, before COVID, this is how we do it. Uh, we have our opening worship and then we preach God's word first before all this comes in, right? We switch it around now for our services because of the online uh, experience. And we find that people, after the sermon, they'll just Research has shown that they, some people, uh, I won't say majority, but some people will just then, oh, finish God's word already because they don't understand, right, the fullness of the worship experience, right? After God's word already, oh, okay, I've sang a song, I've listened to God's word. It's, 
I watch it already. Okay, then they will leave the online. And they are able to do so because it's online, right? Nobody knows when they leave. Uh, whereas in person, well, if after the word, uh, you just stand up and walk away, uh, then people know, oh, then, you know, they're a bit more paise. And so you stay throughout so that you can continue with the rest of the forms of the worship. Uh, but online, you, we don't, and we might not. And so we have switched it around such that the word comes last. Yeah. But when we're able to, maybe we'll get back to this form of uh, this liturgical movement of the fourfold thereafter. Okay. So there's a response of the word. These are all the elements of the word. And then the meal. Uh, the meal offers participation in our Lord Jesus Christ in our worship. And so there's no passive uh, partakers, right? We have to be part of the liturgy. We have to be part of the uh, response to the invitation. Yeah, we have to come forward, open our hearts, open our hands, and to receive, we have to eat, you know. And by doing so, yeah, we are not passive really, we are active participation. We are doing active participation in our worship. And so it helps us to do so. Okay. And then the basic shape of it is that there's an invitation. We give thanks, we break bread, we give the bread, and we partake together. And so now the body of Christ reforms us as his body. Theologically speaking, the body of Christ in the wafer given to us, uh, I mean, as we partake of it, that wafer, that body of Christ reforms us once again as his body, right? Uh, so it's the body forming the body. And it's again a witness to the world of who we are and whose we are. Uniquely amongst all the world religions, the Holy Communion marks us as Christians. When people see, hey, they are doing, they are, they are they are eating together the wafer and they are drinking wine or drinking juice together. Oh, they must be Christians, right? It's a unique witness to who we are, uh, to the world. And when we do so, we are witnessing, okay? And the elements of the meal are as follows. That's the preparation. Uh, when, you know, we open up the tray and we begin to prepare the elements. That's the invitation Christ invites to disable or who love him. That's the Eucharistic prayer, uh, Eucharistic means the uh, grace, uh, prayer of grace, uh, for grace, God's grace we call upon us. It starts, it starts off by the Lord be with you and also with you, right? The responsive uh, dialogue and then the preface. It is right and good and joyful thing everywhere and everywhere to, to give thanks to you, oh my, Father Almighty, right? It's a preface. And then we go on to explain why we do this because on the night in which he gives God for us, he took bread and then he said, uh, and so... Uh, and, and, and he commands us to do all this and then the remembrance like the anamnesis the remembrance and so remembrance of these almighty acts in Jesus Christ offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving right so it is in remembrance that we do this epiclesis is then we invoke the Holy Spirit to come and make these elements the body and blood of Christ uh, without the invocation of the Holy Spirit's presence and to make this body and blood of Christ we're just partaking no more bread and no more and no more juice but when we Pray and ask God to pour His Holy Spirit on us gathered here on this gift of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. We are making the common wafer and common juice the very presence of God's grace made for us available through the body and blood of Christ. All right? And then, of course, we conclude with the doxology to your Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Church. All honor and glory to us, Almighty Father, now and forevermore. Amen. That's the concluding doxology. Okay? And then we pray together the Lord's Prayer, the prayer Lord Jesus taught us. We break bread, we give the bread, and we partake together. And then there's a whole post communion prayer in thanksgiving to God for the grace that He has poured upon us. So that's a meal, right? And the key idea is it is a participatory meal. All of us are participating. And you know, they, even if you don't respond to the words, uh, you are eating, right? That's participation already. Okay? So it is a participatory, participatory meal. Finally, the sending. We are sent from the service of worship back into the mission that God has called us, mission into the world, right? And remember, now that we remember who we are, for the next week, we are going to be who we are back in the world, representing God uh, in the world. Okay, it's a bless the blessing is a summary of what God has done uh, in our worship. Um, and then the dismissal, therefore, sends us back into the world to carry out God's mission. And so you find that in the benediction, usually the pastor or the preacher uh, will reiterate what has been preached by a short summary of the sermon, even through the benediction, because God has revealed this to us. Therefore, now go forth and do it. Okay? And the sending song ends the service with praise uh, and serves as a final reflection 
on God's word. So the worship leader will usually choose a song that is in line with the sermon or that has been preached so that it is our, uh, as we sing it, as we meditate in our hearts upon it, it's our meditation on God and what he has revealed and now our response to him. And so the elements of the sending can include, therefore, the sending or the closing song, uh, the blessing and the dismissal. The blessing is, you know, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The dismissal is, is go forth now into the world, right? The dismissal. And sometimes the final announcements. And now we've been doing some final announcements a bit more regularly because we do have to announce the safe management plans, right? Or the final announcements can be, now they have, now they, at the end of service now, please go down to the info counter and sign up because that's our response to what God is doing uh, through today's service. Okay? So that's the fourfold movement. The Lord makes you shine on, on you and be gracious, gracious, to, you. gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.